for uh, interrupting your worship as we were talking about WWE hairstyles with uh, Keaton. So he's rocking the mullet, and uh, I'm mourning the fact that it's going away, evidently, is what I learned today. So that's that's sad. So apologize. I kind of interrupted a holy moment there for you all while we were talking about important subjects, and I just, as a pastor, I take full responsibility for that. So there you go. Hey, uh, happy Father's Day to you dads out there or to soon-to-be dads, or future dads, uh, uh, and to everyone in this room, and everyone online watching us, uh, connecting, streaming with us at this time, I want to say welcome to you also, and happy Father's Day to you. You know, I've been in uh, ministry now for, for, golly, over 25 years, and I've, I've heard a lot of things, and I've said a lot of things, and I'll tell you a couple of things that I've never, ever heard. I can tell you one thing I've never heard in ministry whatsoever. No man has ever come to me. No dad has ever come to me and said, Tony, you know what? One of the best things that's happened in my marriage is when we got into deep, deep, distracting debt. When we got into debt, man, that really sealed our, our relationship. We had an enemy, a common enemy to de defeat, and that just made me and my wife just grow so much closer. Another thing that I've never heard is no person, man or woman, has ever come to me and said, you know, I discovered when I took on this crazy credit card debt and discovered that I was paying back 19%, that is so good for my health. I mean, my blood pressure is lowered. I'm sleeping better than I've ever slept. I'm just at happy and I'm at peace and I'm content with the world around me. I have never, I can tell you this, for me in my whole life and in all of my ministry, I have never sat across from someone who said, Pastor, would you pray with me and pray for me? And I would say, okay, what do you want to pray about? No one has ever said, let's just thank the Lord right now for my crazy high student loan. I just, want to, I just want to praise God for the fact that we live in America and we have the ability to take out $300,000 to get a bachelor's degree in basket weaving or in, you know, Western, Western Civ or, you know, European poetry, you know. That, that's, what, a, what a great country, what a great education system we experience now that I just thank God for, for this debt. I've never heard any of those things. Now, what I have heard and, and what I have experienced in 25 years is people looking at me with total sincerity in their hearts, total sincerity in their eyes, saying, Pastor, I'd love to give. I'd love to give to the church. I'd love to give to people who are in need. I'd love to be a, a part of that because that truly is such a blessing, but I cannot do it. If, if I give, then we will, not, we will not be able to eat this week. I've, I've heard that, and I've, I've heard people, many people, Say, you know what, I'd love, to, I'd love, I'd love, I'd love to go on a mission trip. When I hear how mission trips change people, change the world, how a mission trip can change my heart, can change my family, can change my experience of how I see the world, I would love to go on a mission trip, but I, I simply can't afford to go. Or I can't afford to take a week off of work. Uh, the only vacation I can have is just that one or two weeks that I'm with my family, and I can't give that up. I've, I've heard from way too many families as a pastor that debt becomes a major wedge between the husband and the wife and how debt can actually cause and send a family into divorce courts. I've heard that way too often. Because of those things, I say this up front. The, the principle that we're teaching today and the, the thought that we are leaning into is that stress is bad. Stress is bad. Specifically, financial stress is bad. Last week, we looked at the principle, less is more. Remember, we talked about how that, that, that more is not more, and more is not better, and more is not what we need, but less is more in life. And today, we're looking at the, the concept that stress is bad. Stress is bad. And today, specifically, Financial stress is bad. During this series, in this series of Making Change, we're looking at how to manage our stuff, how to honor God, and to be able to stand in the gap. Because the reality is this. When you have financial stress that is in your life, I'm just going to tell you, I'm, I'm a pretty plain-spoken guy. It's virtually impossible for you to be able to stand in the gap when you have deep financial stress bearing down on you. It's, it's going to be, I mean, some people can do it, but most can't. 
Most people cannot stand in the gap for other people and meet needs that other people have when, when they are experiencing financial pressures, financial stress, bearing down on them and pushing down upon them as a family and as individuals. Uh, so with that in mind, today what I want to talk about are three prayers. I'm going to teach you three prayers that you can use, that you can lean into in those seasons that you are ex experiencing incredible financial stress. I said this last week, and I want to say it again this week, so that uh, you just we're all on the same page here, and you're not hearing me say something that I don't want you to hear me say. Uh, if you're new especially, know this, that, that some people, when they're teaching on money, the, the principle they're coming from, a pastor, can be, you're doing stuff wrong, and you're a bad person, so start doing what I say. So I, that's not the direction we're going to here. Uh, I don't want you, if you're in deep debt, I don't want you to hear me say that you are wrong, you are bad for being in debt. Because the reality is, is debt is where the vast majority of Americans live. Okay, Because we have bought into the lie that more is more, and more is better, and more is what I want. And so because of that, what do we do? We keep on buying more and more stuff, and we start buying things we don't need, we start buying things that we can't afford, and then when we buy those things, we discover we have to do what? We have to start putting more money into maintaining those things, right? Uh, and so the next thing you know, we got this debt snowball. So the reality is, is most Americans are in debt, and I want you to hear me say that I'm not about to say that shows some kind of moral character. I'm not saying that that shows some weakness on your part. I'm not saying that you're a bad person. Hear me clearly. God is not mad at you because you're in debt. But what I am saying, I'm not saying those things, I am saying this is that debt has a way of robbing joy from people's lives. Debt has a way of robbing freedom from people's lives. Debt has a way of keeping you from the mission and from the purpose that God has made for you in your life. And so we would be irresponsible as a church. We'd be irresponsible as a faith family. We would be irresponsible as a community if we were not trying to tackle this giant problem that is in so many people's lives that we connect with in so many of our family's lives, okay? So I just want to say that up front so that you're not sitting there feeling like you're getting punched or something like that because if you're feeling that, that is the enemy talking to you. That is the enemy trying to discourage you. That is the enemy trying to make you hear things that are not being said so you can be focused on those feelings rather than focus, being focused on how do we get out of this dilemma? How do we get out of this problem? Okay. So with that in, in uh, mind, let's look at three prayers. If you find yourself dealing with debt, if you find yourself feeling the financial stress in life that it's hurting your family, it's it's disrupting your kids' lives, it's disrupting your kids' patterns, it's disrupting the unity within between between you and your spouse, and uh, it's keeping you from standing in the gap and being the person that you know God's designed you to be. What should you do? Well, here's prayer number one. Prayer number one is this: begin praying the prayer, God, give me self-control. God, give me self-control. Proverbs 25, verse 28. Solomon writes, he says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Now, we're not used, for the most part, to live in cities that have walls around them. If you've ever toured places in, in Central America, South America, if you've ever been to old cities in, in Europe, or even some cities in Africa, especially older ones, you would walk through city gates. You would see walls around them. Why? Because when, when there was a time and age when, when large cities or, or large groups of people were preparing for the worst, which was the worst was an invading army coming over the hill to plunder them and to conquer them, what did they do for their protection? They put walls up. They put guards on those walls. And they put gates to allow the good people to go in and the good people to go out, but to keep the bad people from coming in at bad, at, at, in poor timing or in bad timing. And what, what everyone understood who read this parable or read this, this proverb was that a city without walls was vulnerable. A city without walls was defenseless. A city without walls was weak and was prone to be attacked by any invading group of people. 
And Solomon's saying, when we don't have self-control, we are in the same boat as a city without walls. We are vulnerable. We are defenseless. We are weak. Here's the reality that I understand about Americans, uh, all Americans. I don't care who you are. I don't care how rich or poor you are. I don't care how well-educated you are. I don't care how, how uh, spiritual you are, uh, how mature you are. Every American, we have an inner two-year-old within us, don't we? Let's just face it. I don't care how pious you are, how mature you are. Every person here, whether you're 100 years old or whether you're 5 years old, guess what? You still have an inner 2-year-old. What is that inner 2-year-old? That inner 2-year-old is that person inside of you that says, I want it, and I want it now. Right? Give it to me because it, I deserve it. And if you don't get it now, you clench your hands, and you stop in the mud, and you throw a temper tantrum until you get it. Now, every person's temper tantrum could be different. I acknowledge that. Some people's temper tantrums is just stone-cold silence to all the people around them, and they push them out, and basically they give the uncommunicated uh, message of, I'm not going to change how I act till I get what I want. Some people's uh, inner child, their temper tantrum is, I'm going to work in a manic state, and I'm going to amass as much money or as much things as I need to get what I want, and then I'll stop when I get what I want. <coughs> Some people's tantrum is exactly that. It's a tantrum, right? And they're throwing a fit and being a child until, until that spouse caves in, or in some case, the parent caves in, or in some cases, I've even seen sometimes the adult being the two-year-old, and the parents have to, or the children have to cave in to give the parents what they want, right? But all of us, we have this inner two-year-old. And what I'm telling you today is you need to learn to control your inner two-year-old. You need to control that two-year-old that takes over sometimes. And, of course, that goes from all across the area that we're talking about. You know, I, I would say that in regards to relationship issues and work issues, societal issues, how you connect with one another, how you connect with church issues, but especially in the area of your buying power and the area of when you are wanting stuff, I would encourage you to say figure out how to control your inner two-year-old and learn to say no to your two-year-old. When you want that bass boat that costs the same amount as three-fourths of your yearly salary, guess what? Here's a good word. Ben, just say, practice this with me. No. Say it with me. Reverend Ben, you, none of you are saying it with me. There's the bass boat there. You feel like you deserve it. The only problem is it's like $75,000. Right? And you, you go, Tony, that's crazy. Walk around a bass boat show sometime and see how many boats are seventy-five grand, and you're trying to tell your wife, "Oh, we can have it for a forty-year mortgage." You know, just we just got paid two hundred eighty-five dollars for the next forty years. What could go wrong? You know, we can talk about that, right? So, men, I'm going to give you one last chance. It's Father's Day, so I'm a dad. Give me this. It's my birthday today. So I should get what I want today, because I let my two-year-old come out, okay? And what I want from you today is to say no with me, right? So, man, you see the $75,000 boat, and you're like, oh, I could do that for 40 years of bondage, debt bondage. What do you say? Oh, no. No, right? You don't need it. What you do is you get friends with another idiot that bought a $75,000 boat, and you go on their boat with them. That's what I do. Why rent? I rent a boat every once in a while. <laughs> Ladies, you see that? I don't no, I'm making things up now. You see that Michael Kor purse? Okay? I don't know what a Michael Kor purse costs. $5,000! Okay? I, know, I don't think a Michael Kor purse costs that, but I know there are purses that people are carrying around for five grand. Right? Am I, tell, am I telling the truth? Am I telling the truth? And you see that and you think, you know what? I've had a hard year. I've had a hard life. I deserve a whatever purse for $5,000. Ladies, what do you say? No. No, no you don't say yes. You're not listening. You're not listening. You're not listening. Yes. Now I will make you feel bad. Right? You say no. We need to learn to say no. So one of the prayers to help us learn to say no is, God, give me self-control. God, give me self-control. Help me see the big picture. Help me see 
the long game here and know that life is not about just maintaining some possessions and some things. And yeah, some of these things make me happy now, but the reality is every one of us, every one of us, we're an eternal person. That means we're going to last beyond our life. We're going to last beyond this mortal coil uh, in this world. We're going to go into eternity. And there's going to be some of us that our whole life is going to be shown that we're just, we've existed for these things. That $75,000 bass boat, that Michael Core purse, that incredible vacation, maybe putting our kid, you know, laudable things too, maybe putting our kid in some kind of exclusive education or putting our kid all the way through grad school. Yeah, that's a great thing, but not at the point of putting everyone into a debt burden, right? And some of us, we're living for those things, and the reality is life is so much more than those things. Those things. So let's learn to have some self-control and be able to say no to some of these things so that we won't experience stress, financial stress in our lives. A second prayer for us to pray that we need to learn, every one of us needs to learn. God, give me understanding. Give me understanding. You know, part of the problem for us is some of us are in financial debt because we've never had a class on how to manage money, have we? I mean, you think about that. Some of us who are people of a certain age you do remember that, that class in middle school, that one or two days where your teacher taught you how to, how to write a check and how to have a checkbook, right? I mean, I remember that vaguely, that one day where a teacher talked about that. But educators, teachers, is that part of our curriculum today? Yes. Are there some schools that still teach that? Yes. Yes? Okay, cool, cool. Are there some te schools that don't teach that? No? It's state no? requirement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. See, I'm learning things today. What's that? Kids don't listen. Kids don't, but kids don't listen. Larry. So, you know, we, we teach some fundamentals. But, you know, for instance, when our kids, I do remember this as a, as a teenager. When, uh, when I turned 18, you know, one of the things I started getting inundated with were credit card applications. And to an 18-year-old, what does that sound like? Free money, doesn't it? Free money. Someone's willing to, I don't know how they're doing it, but they're making money by giving me money. I guess, I guess they're just charging the, the, uh, the entities that are using those cards. They're, cho they're charging them so much that it's a no-lose no situation for me, Mom. So, yeah, I'm going to take out four or five cards. And, and who cares if I max those all out within a month, right? I don't have to pay that back, right? And I don't have to pay it back at 19 to 27% interest, right? You know, most of us, we just we don't understand the fundamentals of finances, and I'm not talking about crazy levels like how do you short stocks or, you know, those kinds of things. I'm just talking about just the basic, you know, debt to borrowing to, to living ratios. Hosea chapter 4, verse 6, uh, the prophet, he says, My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge, is what the prophet said. The people of Israel were destroyed because they did not understand the things of life and it destroyed them. And, and we fast forward some... 2,500 years, and guess what? We're still in that boat. You know, I was reading this past week and pre preparing for this. Credit card debt is, the average American, it has $7,000 in credit card debt currently, according to the, the Labor Department and some of the finance departments, the, the, the financial departments that, that monitor those things in America. The numbers fluctuate between 6,500, I saw one number as high as 8,000, but in general, it seems like most consensus says average American has $7,000 worth of credit card debt. Now right now, there's some people that are sitting there feeling really good about themselves. You know, they're like, that's, that's what the average person is? Well, my, my, my debt is so much better than that. So right now, there's some people buoyed by that number. There's some of us that are probably feeling defeated by that number because you're like, Oh, I got a lot more than seven thousand. Remember, the seven thousand is the average American. Average American, seven thousand dollars debt. Here's the basic numbers. So, that seven thousand dollars, if you're holding that in debt, then they're going to expect you to pay a minimum of two hundred and fifty dollars a month for that debt. Two hundred and fifty dollars a month at nineteen percent interest, which is a very reasonable interest rate in credit cards. There are some; most are higher than that. 19% is a fairly standard level. It will take 18 years to pay off uh, to pay off that $7,000 debt. 18 years at $250 a month, $7,000. With 19% interest, 
you're paying $45,000 into the credit card company uh, for your debt, for your, for your debt maintenance. Think about that. Think about what you could do for your family, what you could do for yourself. Think about how you could employ forty-five grand over 18 years if, if you weren't giving it to the bank, if you were not giving that money to the lender. And so, but see, some of us, some of us, if we're just armed with that knowledge, would be enough to be able to empower you to tell your inner child no, right? If you know that you're paying 45 grand off to the banks. But see, most of us don't know that. And so we just allow that, to, that process to continue to happen. And so for us, it's, God, give us understanding of exactly what are the consequences of our bad financial management, of our poor financial decisions. And so we need that prayer in our lives. So, God, give me self-control, and God, give me understanding. A third prayer for you to pray, for me to pray, is God, give me a plan. Give me a plan. Proverbs 21, verse 5. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. One of the things we're going to begin doing on, on my Thursday, I do a little podcast type thing on Facebook, a, a live chat on Thursdays usually, and kind of do a hodgepodge of things. We're going to finish up this week looking at our shape, how God's designed us for ministry. We're going to look at experiences. And then after that, what we're going to do is kind of retool that to answer the question, how can we live the best life ever? How do we do that? And what we're going to do is spend a, an extended period of time just taking a little five to seven minute chat every week looking at ways in which we can live the best life. And what we're going to do is have an extended study in wisdom literature found in the Bible. We're going to be looking at the Proverbs very closely and looking at how God has given us a playbook that starts with knowing Him, not just knowing about Him, but knowing Him personally. It begins there, and from that point on, God gives us the ability to make wise decisions make sound choices that lead to a blessed experience on planet Earth, a blessed life on Earth and in Heaven to follow. And so we're going to look at how can we experience the best life ever. And so this verse comes right out of that thinking. So let's take some serious thought in the, the, the verse found in Proverbs 21 here. The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. There are two very important words here that really are linchpins for this verse. The first one is diligence, or the plans of the diligent. Have you ever thought about what it means to be diligent in life? Diligent. Well, you think about it, it means a person that has a plan. It means the person who has the capacity to follow through. If you're diligent, that means you're going to follow through on the things that you need to do to, that you may be promised or the things you need to do to be successful in life. Diligent is a person who is thought of as being steady. Right? Good times come, that person is steady. Bad times come, that person is steady. The idea of being able just to continue to walk the road that's assigned to you, no matter what the weather is, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what is going on around you, you are doing what you're called to do. You're doing your assignment. You know, a few years ago, there was a whole lot of research and a whole lot of data showing that one of the biggest uh, reasons for success, one of the biggest things that you can do in your life to be successful in the business world is just simply show up, right? And then the next day, show up. And then the next day, show up. And during good times, you show up. And during bad times, you show up. And specifically, you show up on time, right, for your boss. I mean, every person here who's retired or nearing retirement, am I telling the truth that it just says something, your success in your life, a lot of it was you showed up when you didn't want to show up, right? And you did the job when, you did, when you'd rather do something else, right? That is half the game right there. And the writer here is saying the diligent person, the person who shows up even when it's tough to show up, the person that shows up even when, uh, when she uh, has better things to do and more fun things to do, but she still shows up to do her job. This writer uh, is saying that the plans of this kind of person does what? They lead to profit. They lead to profit. <clears throat> 
as surely as haste leads to poverty. Haste is the second word here in this verse that is so important. You know what I did? I did a, a, a word study on haste, the, the Hebrew word of haste. You know, it very interesting, very interesting stuff here. Uh, you know what literally the Hebrew word for haste means? You want to know? It took me a while to, to discover this, but I found out, Dave, do you know what the Hebrew is? Because you've had Hebrew before, haven't you? You've had Hebrew. Yeah, so did, have you ever done a haste? You're going to be so intrigued by this. You ready? <laughs> Not, so haste literally means I felt sad, so I went out shopping. That's what it means. No, I'm I'm, I, I just had to throw that in there for you. Right? That's not what haste means. But 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 what, here's what it does mean. It means literally to live without a plan. To be a person who lives without a plan in their life. And the writer is saying, look, if you're able to show up, if you're able to do the job, to do what, you, what you're supposed to do, what you're supposed to be doing day in and day out, you're going to, you're going to experience profit in your life. But if you're going to be a person that lives without a plan, just shoots from the hip, and he, trust me, hey, you guys know me, most of you know me, I'm a guy that shoots from the hip, right? But I learned a long time ago, if I live my life just shooting from the hip in all things, then I'm going to be, I need to prepare myself to live in poverty. To live in poverty. And so I can tell you one area, one area of my life, the financial area of the Turner home, there is no haste there. There is no living without a plan. We have a plan in place, and we've lived for 20 plus years with a plan in place for our lives. You see, here's the reality. For all of us, we will experience it. We will wander in debt, right? You've heard that before. You've probably said that before, maybe. I, I wandered into debt. Guess what? You can wander into debt. You will never wander out of debt, right? You will never do that. You, you will stumble into debt. That happens. You will never stumble out of debt. Never, ever, ever. You can count on that. Uh, 100%. 100%. And so we have to begin to live with a plan in our lives. Now, honestly, I don't have the amount of time today. We don't have the extended amount of Sundays to talk deeply into that plan. One of the things I've talked to a couple of our church folks that have gone through some training in the past and we have plans this fall to create sort of a Money Matters University. A Money Matters U where we're going to give an opportunity uh, for a short period of time to meet together weekly to have sort of a small group experience where we're looking specifically at finances and looking at very specifically at what is a plan you can use to create, to get yourself out of debt because you can't wander out of debt. I would invite that if you have any kind of financial issues, if you have questions about finances, if you're a young man or a young woman just starting out in life, this would be a perfect place for you to come. We're going to set it up at a time that it does not compete with any other small group. So if you're already in a small group, we're not asking you to connect. We're not asking you to join, have to quit one group of people that you know and love, that's your tribe, to go to a new one. We're saying for a season, go to two. Go to two. And if you're sitting back going, man, I don't know if I have the time or the ability to uh, do, do, do two small groups in my life for a short period of time, for six or eight weeks, then I would say, well, okay, I guess you enjoy spending $45,000 over the next 18, 19 years. Good luck with that one. Okay, enjoy that while you, but you got enough, you got some free time throughout the week to think about how in debt you are and how much, you know, you know misery you're in at that moment. You know, good luck there on that. In the meantime, this is what I would say to you as far as plans. Here's what you do. Here's what you do. If you haven't, if you haven't figured this out, a create a budget. Create a budget that's real, that's workable, and that you're able to do it. In your budget, it, you're not the U.S. government, so you cannot run a deficit. If you're running a deficit, it's time to learn less is more and cut some things out. And you better make sure that you're in the black, not in the red, in your budget, and that it's real. And then after that, it's not sexy, but here's the deal: build an emergency fund. Because emergencies happen all the time. And I would recommend a $1,000 emergency fund. You will be amazed when you have $1,000 there for when a bad thing happens, the lack of stress that will be in your life when that, when that uh, uh, tire blows on your, in your car. Or uh, what the Turners experienced last week, you notice a couple of floorboards warp and you're like, huh, that's weird. And then two days later, that, oh, that's where it turns into, oh, I figured it out. Our refrigerator's leaking. And we can fi figure out we've got to buy a new refrigerator. Guess what? There wasn't a moment of time where we were like, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Because we had an emergency fund set up. 
to be able to purchase those kinds of things. After you build that emergency fund, begin paying that debt mountain that you have. Begin figuring out how to pay down your debt. And as you begin paying down your debt, begin to save. And out of savings, begin investing, right? Super simple plan, guys. I spent two months in, or two minutes into it. I realized it's more complicated than that. I realized there's a lot of other things to work through, and I'm not trying to say, oh, it's as simple as one, two, three, four, five, right? There's a lot of things that go into it. So I'd encourage you, if you don't have a plan, then come and be a part of our of our Money Matters You when we launch that, so that you can develop a plan. I'd also say this for free, something I've learned over the years. When you hit stage four, when you're beginning to save, there are two people you need in your life. One, you need a good insurance agent to make sure you're protected during really bad times. And you can it's possible for you to be overinsured because you're around a person that's just wanting to take all those commission fees. And so there's some people that have a crazy amount of insurance that they don't need. But it's also, many of our people are underinsured also, right? And so when something bad happens, their life is ruined. And so if you don't have a good insurance agent, come to me because there's several insurance agents I'd recommend you. There's a couple that are in our church, in our facility that, that we use, that my wife and I use, that we trust. And so we'd love to connect you to a good insurance agent. A second person for you to connect with uh, at stage four when you begin saving is this, a retirement plan. Figure out a, a person that can help you develop a plan for long-term, for your long-term health. This is what I would say to you. I would say avoid, there's a million people out there that you can go to, to for retirement planning. I would, what we do, the Turners, is we find a fiduciary, a fiduciary. Don't go with just someone who's selling retirement plans because most companies, what they do is they have a product that they don't care how you prosper. What they care about are they making and they hitting their are they hitting their numbers so that they get paid. And so you can find someone that they all of a sudden found themselves into into uh, investment brokerage, but they they don't have a heart. They don't have an understanding of how are you going to benefit. And then as a result, as your boat is being raised, so is their boat. Right? Uh, a fiduciary is charged and understands that they can only speak in your interest. And so when you're looking for, for not just debt retirement, but when you're looking at financial planning, find a fiduciary out there that can give you sound financial advice, and they're not, they're not making uh, money off of, off of your, off of your uh, uh, investments behind the scenes that you don't even see, okay? I've made that mistake, and I've been there where I was bragging people like, oh yeah, I only pay 2%, it, and, and then I discovered, no, actually I'm paying like 15%, but it's all these fees that are hidden deep and, and you got to peel the onion. It's crazy. So that, that's just an additional thing there. Here's the reason why we're talking about this, friends. Not because I want to poke around in people's uh, financial affairs. You know, people think preachers love to poke into, into people's you know, bedrooms and into people's pocketbooks. And honestly, I don't want to look in your bedroom. I don't want to look in your pocket. Okay? I don't, I don't you know, those things don't, don't, I don't get into that. But I come to a realization that too many of us, too many people that I care about, too many people that I love, too many people that are part of the family of God that we call Northbridge Church, we're missing out on God's great call in this life because we're stressed out to the max. And that stress has almost 100% to do with finances. What would look life look like for us to be able to say yes when God puts His call in our lives and we don't have to look at our checkbook before we can say yes to God? What would that look like for you? What would it look like to say, you know what, I can go on that trip because I know I have the finances in place to be able to go on that trip. I don't have to say, oh, what do I have to cut out? Will I not be able to pay on that boat that has that 40-year loan on it? Right? But too many of us uh, are in that place. But what would it look like if we could say, yeah, we'll go when we hear the call to go? What would it look like when we have the ability to immediately, on a dime, on a dime, be able to invest in kingdom growth opportunities when we're given the opportunity? There are some of us in this room today who who are there right now. 
And I can tell you that, that Northbridge Church would not be here today had it not been for the incredible, the incredible influence and the incredible generosity of a group of people. And to you, if you're in this room and some people have been here for a while and they moved on, I say thank you. Thank you so much for, for your investment and how you were able to cut the check and how you're able to spend the time and do the work, the hard work of building a church. I, I say thank you and God bless you. And I know that there's incredible blessing for you to be a part of that. But I also understand that that experience that you have in your life, uh, all of us need to experience that. All of us need to know what it's like to be able to be used of God in every part of us. Every part of us. Our time, our passions, our, our talents, but also, yes, our, our checkbooks and our finances as well. All of us need to be in a place where we can be used of God 100% and we don't have to experience the stress that is bad, the stress that is killing us right now. I invite you in this moment as we conclude just to bow your heads. And we're going to have a time of prayer right now as the band comes up. And I just say to you, maybe, you know, I gave three prayers and maybe one of them right now you whisper to God. Maybe right now you're saying, God, help me have control. God, give me a plan. God, give me understanding. Perhaps our prayer is, God, God, I'm experiencing financial stress in my life right now. Help me to develop a plan. Help me to develop a, a heart to get out of that stress so that I can experience your great calling in my life. Father, you hear the cries of your people today. And Lord, we... This is an area we're called to be disciples. We're called to be followers of you in every area of our lives, God. How we view the world around us, how we connect to our neighbors, the things we say, the things we do, the jobs we have. And yes, God, how we manage the resources that you've given us. So help us, God, to learn the principles of being great managers of those resources and to be people who use those resources for your kingdom good. These things we pray in your son's powerful name. Amen. I invite you to stand to your feet. I invite you to ask you to sing along with the band. If you need to talk to someone, Pastor Dave, Pastor John are over here. I'll be at the back of the room. You can grab one of us during this time. You can grab one of us after, after we're done uh, in this season. Mm -hmm.